Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Yazi Garami. She's an Iranian-Canadian artist, founder of Blue Earth Films, and a world wanderer. She was born in Shiraz, Iran, and is based in Toronto, Canada. Her enthusiasm her enthusiasm in topics such as sociopolitical justice for world refugees and women's rights nominated her two short documentaries, Away from the Walls and A Day with Lev, at the Cine Siege Film Festival. She edited Rice Balls in the same year, which was also nominated at the Cine Siege Film Festival. Yazi is the editor of the award-winning short documentary, Gorilla. Her first feature film, feature-length documentary, Sustenance, is about food's journey around the world, exploring controversies revolving around food and its interconnections with justice, climate change, and sustainability. She co-produced her second feature documentary, Age of Iron, with her brother Davud. Age of Iron takes viewers on a journey through Asia and in, in its poetic critique of global capitalism, dissecting the system's inherent byproducts along the way, exploitation of the masses in the political south, and alienation of the masses in the affluent north. So first off, thank you for your work in the world. Second, thank you for being in the program. Thank you, Derek. Uh, thanks for having me. Truly an honor. Um, so let's talk about sustenance. Uh, what is it and how did it come to be? And and yeah, let's start with that. What is it and how did it come to be? Sure. Uh, sustenance is basically a, a journey of food around the world. Um, and the, uh, the story is basically starting with a group of friends, seven friends with different eating habits and diets. And, uh, you know, they decide to find out if their food uh, and eating habits are sustainable or not. Uh, and me as a filmmaker, I basically go after each person's food and diet and um, take the story of health. And then we connect it to the issue of um, justice, climate change and sustainability. In a nutshell, that's what the story is about. So let's take let's let's take one one of the foods and maybe more than one of the foods. Let's start with whichever food you want and do exactly what you did in the film. Sure. So um, I start with uh, my first friend uh, and, you know, she mostly eat uh, fast food. Um, and, uh, you know, I basically go after her food. And as most of us by today know how factory farming has been affecting, uh, you know, the food system and also our planet, uh, you know, we just basically take her diet and uh, we interview different people and, and discuss the uh, the dangers of, of having that diet and, you know, why is it cheap and who is really costing, I'm sorry, paying um, the real price of, of that cheap food. Um, then we uh, continue with basically vegan vegetarian diets as very, um, you know, popular diet these days. And, um, and also as a former vegetarian vegan myself, uh, you know, we discuss how it's affecting uh, the well-being of a person. And also, um, you know, causing deforestation and desertification around the world and also creating a lot of problems for those people uh, creating that food. Uh, and continuing, you know, we have a pescatarian friend, um, you know, eating only fish and seafood. And then we go to the oceans and we discuss how that eating habit is also not sustainable and continuing on to two children's diet. Uh, one um, one child, uh, you know, is a very picky eater, mostly eating sugar, and then the other child has um, allergic reactions and uh, food problems, you know, and food digestion, specifically with dairy. Uh, so those are basically the people that, uh, you know, we, we have in the film that, you know, uh, we go back and forth between the food and eating habits. So the first part of the film pretty much starts in Ontario, Canada, because that's where we're all based from. And then uh, we take it to North America and then to Europe. And then at the second half of the film, we basically go to the desert belt of the earth, uh, starting with, uh, you know, North Africa and then going to Central Asia and um, also the Middle East. So we also visit that part of the world and, and show what is our eating habits in the other side of the world is affecting the planet and also the well-being of other people. So one thing that I that just has fascinated me forever is this whole uh, tracing back where where materials come from. Um, in my most recent book, Bright Green Lies, we do that with the the stuff that's in solar panels or in wind turbines. And in a language older than words, one of my favorite parts of that book was I went to dinner with a friend of mine at this lovely um, Vietnamese restaurant. And then 
because he was a corporate researcher, he was able to help me with this, that we basically took, you know, I think I had some sort of chicken dinner and he had some sort of uh, vegetarian broccoli thing. And we, we, we traced back like where we made best guesses for where the chicken came from, where the rice came from, where the broccoli came from. And it was, it was extraordinary because you know, the chicken was associated with factory farms in Arkansas. Meanwhile, I was raising chickens outside my door and his wasn't any better. The broccoli came from Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. So is that some of what you do with this? Yes, exactly. So, uh, one of the things that fascinated me throughout making um, of sustenance was that living in North America, how, you know, our food is pretty much coming from everywhere in the world. And and mostly, uh, you know, we're not self-sufficient or uh, we, we can be, but but the system is not designed that way that, you know, we can just grow our own food and, you know, have it convenient around us rather than, you know, uh, because of the price of food and how the politics are basically played. Uh, so that was one thing that was actually one of the reasons um, that that we decided to um, turn this to a documentary. I mean, the logic behind it is pretty much uh, we're living in a system today where everything is determined by revenue of capital. So we live in an economy that is capital based. And because that is not humane and everything is based on limitless profit, limitless labor and resources and consumption, whereas in reality, we are living in limited, you know, we're living in a world with limited consumption, limited labor and limited resources. So this system is not sustainable. It's unsustainable. And that is, um, you know, why we decided to kind of like have a logic of sustenance based on. Um, so basically starting the movie with the topic of health because everyone is interested of knowing how healthy their food is, and then really uh, going to the deeper problem of colonialism and of slavery, <laughs> and also, you know, who is really paying um, the real price um, of our food consumption? I mean, uh, who is really dying? What is dying? Um, that was basically um, the goal for this journey of sustenance, and, uh, you know, we can have different eating habits and different uh, ideologies when it comes to food. But one thing is very, very clear that this way of living at all is not sustainable. And uh, that's something that you explain very well in the film. And also, um, you know, uh, specifically speaking, checking the, the ethics and justice part of it. Um, is it, you know, when we say a food is healthy, for example, or affordable, who is it affordable for? Is it for ourselves or are we really thinking about the entire planet? Um, or when we're talking about the ethics and justice of, um, you know, vegetarian and vegan food. Um, OK, well, where is that soy is coming from? And isn't that causing, uh, you know, <laughs> deforestation in the Amazon or, you know, uh, you know, where the avocados are coming from? Isn't it what's causing basically the extinction of, of bees in the uh, Colombian forests? So, uh, you know, I mean, we can go on and on about, <laughs> about that topic of health or my food is better than yours. But I basically wanted to uh, look at the bigger picture and say, we're all all in this together and um, you know <laughs> it's it's easy to say I'm living in this side of the world and you know it's, it's convenient for me to eat that way or this way but uh, you know knowing that where our food is coming from and that cycle uh, that I think was very important to reintroduce and, and talk about so hopefully people can really choose their uh, what they're eating and also thinking ethically about about what's happening um, with their with the current food system can you can you give some specific examples of what you mean by food being related to colonialism well let's start with that um, how would um Okay, I don't eat as many potato chips as I used to because uh, they're not good for me, but uh, but I love potato chips. Oh, no, no, I just had a chocolate bar. <laughs> so so like five minutes before we started, I ate, I ate a Heath bar with – it was very good. Anyway, <laughs> so how is that related to colonialism? Or if you don't, if you don't want to do chocolate, do something else. Sure, I don't care so what. 
So, um, you know, mostly we talk about grains in, in the food and I love to bring the topic of grain, uh, you know, living in both sides of the world. Uh, I was born in Iran and I've seen, you know, the importance and, and basically uh, agriculture of wheat uh, all my life. I grew up with that uh, near near the city where I was uh, born and lived in. So, you know, uh, grains, for example, that's a very good example of uh, agriculture based food. So um, let's say in India, uh, you know, where lots of rice and other grains are being basically cultivated um we basically know we're now knowing and understanding how uh, most of people that are farmers first of all you know they can't afford this way of living they uh, you know we know one of the main uh, causes of suicides uh, by farmers i mean around the world but also in india is basically suicide they can't afford um you know um, the higher costs of food production and you know they sell it for really cheap so yes we are purchasing really cheap food made by basically slavery. It's not even paid <laughs> wages. Um, lots of places, you know, in farms and agriculture-based food, there are children and women working. I mean, the example of that in the film is the cotton um, field where you see mostly women and children working in those fields, cultivating um, cottons. And, you know, that is the reason why we're having those green grains for really, really low price um to the other side of the world so yes maybe rice that i buy at costco or walmart here is very cheap but it's ch it's cheap for whom <laughs> it's cheap for me purchasing it here but who is really paying the price or who is not getting paid and who is working under uh you know extreme conditions uh, another example that i can give is uh, you know, in these countries that, uh, for example, in the Middle East, who is purchasing the oil, first of all, uh, you know, other side of the world, um, other uh, modern or, you know, <laughs> countries where they're purchasing the oil from underdeveloped countries, let's say Saudi Arabia, let's say, you know, Iran, let's say, you know, the Middle East. Um, and we are supporting those kind of systems and governments. And then what's happening is that there is more dictatorship and there is more um, suppression of people. Uh, in that in that region so really when you think about it it's it's not just and it's basically modern day slavery and that's not a um you know recent story the story of civilization and agriculture and you know i mean we're seeing we don't need to even talk about it and what's happening in the uh, north africa and you know in the middle east um, that and how it turned to desert that is the reason why um and you know basically we, we wanted to discuss that and, and talk about the discredital of civilization in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, we've been doing that for thousands of years. And the result of that is deforestation and what we see that is left of, you know, that region or the desert belt of the, of the world. And, uh, it was basically a warning in the film and not a solution, but as a filmmaker, we just wanted to say, hey, uh, this has happened. It's going to happen again. <laughs> Can we just, you know, go back to history and uh, kind of find out why, what went wrong and rethink everything? And uh, our message is mainly rethinking holistically. OK, so I want to ask you about what went wrong and rethinking holistically in a moment. And um, so please help me remember to ask you that in a moment. But I want to come back to, to something else first, which is, um, and you, you've, you've hinted at this and you've talked about it, but can you really nail down why someone in Ontario, or I lived in Spokane, Washington at the time, why someone in Spokane, Washington would eat a chicken dinner that involved factory farm chicken from Arkansas when I had chickens outside my door and would involve broccoli from Mexico when you can grow broccoli outside your kitchen window in Spokane or the same with Ontario, that how would we, how would you make, how, how would a system develop that is so absurd as to bring in broccoli to Ontario from Mexico? Do you see what I'm asking? Uh, of course, yes. So, you know, I mean, it's absurd, of course it's absurd that it's absolutely unnecessary for us to have uh, food policies and food systems that are working that way. Uh, you know, I mean, and also a part of it is that as consumers, uh, this is what we are demanding and this is what we're also getting in return. Uh, I always say, you know, a system cannot <laughs> survive if you don't support it. 
um, I have had this discussion with many, many of my friends where we go and talk about, you know, this this pattern of why are we, are we getting our broccoli or avocado from other countries or why are we getting, you know, uh, things that we can even grow from, from other places. I mean, the great example in Ontario is uh, if you want to get a, you know, farm raised organic lettuce here, you have to pay twice the price. It, but if you get it organic and from the U.S., it's way cheaper. Uh, and it doesn't make sense. Absolutely doesn't. Uh, we need to also um, rethink all of these food policies and also really change them. Um, it should not. It's not OK that we have access to all of these different kinds of food uh, every day of a year. And, you know, the amount of money that we're spending and also energy that we're spending just for transportation and also supporting uh, you know, fossil fuel industry uh, in every bite. That's absolutely ridiculous. Where we can be self-sufficient, we can support um, local food production system around us. Um, and once we start supporting those systems, you know, uh, I think it will be clear that it's not going to be okay, uh, you know, for, for this important exports of food in, in this at this level. Um, so, yeah, it's. <laughs> I think it's absolutely ridiculous that at the moment uh, this is how uh, the system is running, uh, specifically speaking with food. And, you know, you, you, you said in your bio that your enthusiasm for topics such as justice for world refugees. And, you know, back in the 90s, I was um, involved in uh, farmers who opposed NAFTA in great measure because they knew that it would it would. Uh, devastate subsistence farmers in Mexico, that there would be this mass rush of corporate grown corn from the United States would flood the markets of Mexico and make it so those local farmers couldn't, you know, who might have five acres, 10 acres, they would not be able to compete with the price of, of corn from Iowa. And so can you draw the links? I mean, it's so clear to me at least that there is a relationship between um, global trade and heavily subsidized global trade and um, movements and, 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 and influxes of refugees to industrialized nations. Of course, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, and we're seeing that in every uh, pocket and part of the world. Um, also, when we were traveling, uh, it was very interesting to me as I would see that uh, for one of the great examples in Spain, uh, you know, we have in Spain and Italy, we have uh, North African uh, laborers that are basically, uh, you know, <laughs> migrating from from North Africa to south of Europe for, you know, for money and for working in fields. Um, and the same thing happening uh, in the borders of Iran and Afghanistan uh, during the war, at least uh, that was happening a lot as well. Uh, you know, in every part, in every part of the world, if you pay attention to see, you know, when people or farmers cannot make money or they can't, you know, um, have that way of living, they will go somewhere else and they'll work in the other part of the world. And then <laughs> we also know that that's also uh, you know, connected to the topic of uh, racism. I mean, it's very normal how many times we hear it that, oh, you know, people coming from other part of other countries and working here. No, really. I mean, they're coming. Why are they migrating from, you know, their own home? Why did they left their own home to come here to work? Uh, you know, and, and this is very much an example that is happening everywhere. Um, sadly, a lot of people will, you know, get it as ideologies of, you know, where we need to have our own uh, work in our own country and we shouldn't allow other people to come and work in our country and um, again introductions of, of, uh, of fascism and racism as we can see throughout history but uh, you know this is going to happen more and more I mean uh, another great example of it is within borders of, of India um, what's happening in Kashmir uh, having amazing fertile soil and and water and why there is battles and years of uh, you know genocide and and um, killing other people for this fertile land and and what access to water um and you know food food production so uh, and the story goes on and on you know and it and it repeats itself and as long as this is a system um it's only going to get worse so you have you've brought up um, the issues of of 
let's let's return to the question I was going to ask you to remember what question I was going to ask um, about uh, the origins of the problem and the origins of agriculture. Can you talk about some of the problems that go back to the beginning and and talk about the some of the structural inherent problems in agriculture that we can see if we look at history? Sure. So, uh, you know, a, a part of it in the movie where um, I think uh, Lear, Keith and, and you discuss, uh, you know, really, really, <laughs> I mean, amazingly and, uh, you know, in, in a nutshell, basically. So the story, of, for example, of agriculture in, uh, you know, um, in North Africa or in the Persian Empire, uh, you know, it was basically because of agriculture that uh, a Persian empire was able to basically uh, grow so, so much. And, uh, you know, same thing with North Africa, you know, the Egyptians. And yes, they made the pyramids and we can still see the beautiful art and um, everything in the, in the museum right now and see that there were some uh, results of that system of um, civilization. But uh, how it was, how we were able to, to have that was, because of agriculture. So the, the, the minute we were able to basically um, find out how we can control the food system, that it was also parallel with the concept of power. So whomever can take care of that food system and supply and demand and um, have access to it and grow it, then that person has, you know, the power and that person can rule over other people. Um, so that system is basically agriculture and civilization go uh, both hand in hand <laughs> together. And what comes down is basically a hierarchy on the very top, who is, you know, basically the main power. And then underneath of that pyramid are basically the food um, providers. These are the laborers and, and farmers and children and women and people that are getting paid almost nothing and working day and night to create uh, that supply and that money. Uh, for the great power. Um, and eventually, all of these civilizations and systems collapse uh, over the history um, as we know it. And so, yeah, that, that's basically um, what is also discussed in the, in the film as well. And I, I think that most of us take agriculture as, as the only, only food system that there has ever been. And in fact, we take um agriculture as in terms of cash cropping especially as the only food food production system that has ever existed but can you talk about some of the alternatives that uh have worked or continue to work through parts of the world um can you talk about some of the alternatives that ag that that especially cash crop agriculture has replaced of course. So, uh, you know, there are other alternatives. And um, if we want to look into history before uh, the concept, uh, sorry, before the uh, start of agriculture uh, based societies, we have hunter gatherers. Right. Uh, we have different tribes, uh, different hunters and gatherer gatherers living in communities, uh, you know, um, and they eat what they hunt. They, they hunt together. They live together. Um, and this this is not a new concept. It's been older than than agriculture. Um, and I wanted to include that in the film as well. That is why uh, we visited basically Central Asians, uh, nomads, and also in North Africa, um, tribal communities that they uh, live with their herds and live with their um, animals and they migrate, um, you know, and living a nomadic uh, lifestyle. Um, so, yes, that that system is pretty much, you know, you are living among other members of your community. Uh, you know, everybody has within the community different uh, tasks and works. Um, and, you know, the amount of food is basically um, it's basically the closest way to the sustainable way of living is actually that way of living as, as is basically getting less and less every year as well. Um, as discussed in a film. So, you know, if we had, uh, we all know that the uh, amount of people that, you know, the percentage of population of people living as hunter gatherers now or indigenous communities um, are basically shrinking. Um, and they all have no other way than to, you know, join cities and um, fam get familiarized to the other concept of food system, which is agriculture based. But it's a, it's an alternative and, you know, it's also practical. 
um, I mean, living and staying with with these tribes, uh, I understood that, you know, nothing goes to waste, first of all. You know, if you're killing one animal and you're eating it, the entire tribe uses everything from skin to pretty much everything. I mean, I can't really think of uh, anything that goes to waste. Um, and, you know, living with nature in harmony and in sync with nature um, is also something else that can be completely understood and felt living with these communities. Uh, you know, something that we are far, far away uh, from experiencing um, in today's uh, way of living and consuming agriculture based food is that we are so um, attached from how our food is being produced and we're so far away from uh, you know how hunting and gathering and how living and sing with nature is just basically um, strange ideas for 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 new generation or for people living in cities uh, and that's something that you know I wanted to really portray in the film and uh, talk about um, it absolutely amazed me how you know, living within those communities, how the food tastes, how it's made, how it's done, um, really an, an amazing experience. Um, you mentioned how the food tastes. What did you mean by that? I mean, you know, <laughs> we, we we go to restaurants here and we're like, how does the food taste? How does it taste? And, you know, how many stars do we give it? You, you know, everywhere we traveled, we were living, you know, most of the places in Central Asia, we were staying in tents uh, with these nomadic tribes. So we were eating pretty much what they were eating. And the taste of the food is like, all I could describe is it's a taste of love because, you know, this animal lived freely in the pastoral landscape. They, you know, it, it grows with this community. They take care of it. And you know exactly what you're eating and it, you can feel it in the in the food as well. Uh, one of the things that I always talk about um, and I can never forget the taste is, you know, the, as, as soon as there are strangers coming to these tents, uh, you know, the, the tribe leader usually get, gives you um, a fresh milk. Uh, with black tea and um, sugar or anything that they make it, you know, sweet with whatever. Or sometimes it's a date or anything sugary. So they'll just give you that or a piece of bread um, as a welcome, you know, welcome to our tribe, welcome to our community. And you can just taste it's like a freshly squeezed milk, you know, tea and what else do you want? And a freshly baked bread. And it's just, you know, um, very, very different from how we would basically just go to grocery stores most of the time buying fruits and vegetables that have no taste because they're GMO based or, you know, um, hydroponic um, vegetables that have absolutely no taste and it's been sprayed probably. And then, uh, you know, comparing it with how food is grown um, within these communities or basically uh, it's hunted or it's gathered right there and it's cooked in front of you and it's fresh. Uh, really, really different, right? <laughs> if you compare it with how um, how the food uh, consumption is here, and compare it with uh, with the other side of the world. So I have I have two quick stories about that. One of them is that I live in far northern California, and until I moved here, I never liked berries because I only had them from the grocery store, and they were just little sort of I don't know, just like they tasted kind of like cardboard. And since I moved here, I've become a total fanatic about blueberries, blackberries. I love them now because I get them fresh off the off the plants and it doesn't taste anything the same. And the other is I never really liked tomatoes that much. And then a couple of years ago, I was at the feed store and somebody had set up a table outside the feed store with uh, heirloom tomatoes that they were selling from their farm that they had picked like that day. And I thought, what the heck, I'll try one. And I all of a sudden couldn't understand why anybody ever invented candy because these tomatoes were one of the most delicious things I've ever had in my life, as opposed to store-bought tomatoes. Or I hate watermelons these days. Just they, they, they don't taste like anything. Or strawberries. Strawberries from the grocery store, they're all terrible. Absolutely, yes. It's... Uh... Another example in the film when we uh, visited the Polyface farm uh, in Virginia, where we interviewed Joel Salatin. Uh, at the end of the day, we would basically eat uh, from from whatever the the crop and the food was from the farm that day. And what a difference! I mean, it's just you know, I, I, words cannot describe it. Like you literally can taste. Um, you know, flavors that somehow it goes back to you. You have to dive in in your memories and say, ah, 
this is how it's supposed to taste like and because of that that's another reason why i mean we don't really get um warm weather here in canada i mean in ontario most most of the time is cold but the few months that we do get some sun and really good weather um you know i'm so excited because that's where i get the gardening things out and i'm always you know so fanatic about growing at least uh, some herb garden vegetables and tomatoes and cucumbers and uh, because i just miss that and um you know it's it's almost becoming normal to to say oh this cucumber tastes like water or this tomato tastes like nothing and it's and you're right it's absolute tastes like nothing and then you compare it with farm grown or you know homegrown uh goods and you're you just like wonder why <laughs> and again it's again for a cheap price and also no taste and nutritional value and just profit of some uh basically corporations right <laughs> so you've talked about hunter gatherer can you also contrast and you also talked about pastoralists but can you also talk a little bit about the cash crop system versus subsistence farming, uh, which is something else that humans have done for a very, very long time, which is not really the same thing as agriculture? All right. So, uh, you know, again, uh, it is possible to, you know, to have a sustainable um, and uh, seasonal kind of like food system and and support those kinds of farming and also uh, you know um, holistic management uh, type of food production um, including um, grass-fed farming and uh, you know uh, pastoral uh, food production so all of those are are doable uh, why we're not supporting that and doing that more um, it's you know again the concept of profits to be made uh, and also you know um, <laughs> we need to again turn that into policies um, I mean throughout the film I, I just uh, basically go around and visit different farms um, and talk to farmers and uh, one thing that I've noticed is how hard it is becoming for uh, you know these kinds of farmers to to survive um, and I think in one of the farms that I visited uh, it was in Innisfil and they, the farmer, Lisa Peterson, she explained to me that um, basically the reason why we have access to cheap food in grocery stores is because those farms almost get paid nothing. Right. And because they're creating food in, in large uh, quantities, they're able to basically um, go on to the next year. And she compared it with um, local farms or small scale farmers where, you know, the only way they can sell their food is directly to people that, you know, pass by from the farm or just like to the neighborhood around them. And she explained something around like 40 percent of her profit would be going to grocery stores or those stores selling the product rather than to her. Um, and on top of that, she has the cost of, you know, taking care of the farm and feeding the animals and feeding the land. So it's almost leaving farmers with no money. And on top of that, we, we always always complain, oh, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. So, again, that comes back to uh, the way we are supporting and what we're supporting and what kind of food system we're, uh, we're supporting. And traveling throughout the world, I realized, uh, sadly, North America is by far <laughs> of the the worst example of supporting, you know, um, communities uh, within their territories for, 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 you know, relying on food um, uh, and and uh, basically sustaining themselves compared with even in Europe. Um, I saw like, you know, there are way more um, engagement between consumers and food providers um, and. And the, the best example of it was living in, I mean, traveling in North Africa and the Middle East and Central Asia. That is where you really, really see that, oh, you know, um, f basically farm to table concept. You'll see it there till today it's because there, there are no other ways. I mean, going to big grocery stores is still in most places that we go and visit and throughout the film is not like these concepts are not still accepted. I mean, you go to your baker first thing in the morning in the neighborhood and you grab your fresh bread and you go, you know, um, to the butcher and you get the, the fresh meat that was just, you know, um, produced that day. 
Um, whereas we see, you know, in North America that this is not the situation. I mean, how is the fastest and cheapest way for me to get my food? Okay, I'm going to go online, order it on Walmart, and then I'm going to go pick it up and <laughs> find out that absolutely, you know, I'm not going to find out where the food was coming from, where it was created, and uh, you basically very happy that, oh, it was too cheap and it was, um, you know, it, it was free. And Sorry, it was really fast to uh, to access that. Um, so I want to come back to farm to table in a moment, but can you talk about uh, uh, something that has been very concerning for oh gosh, 80 years at least in the in North America and at least as long elsewhere too is the collapse of of the small farmer. Um, can you can you talk a bit more about that explicitly? Of course, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, I believe in North America, uh, f within the past 50 years, uh, that that's based on uh, the statics that the, uh, Lisa was telling me at, in Innisfil Farm, uh, that it basically collapsed from 30 something percent to now 3 percent. So that's a huge number. <laughs> I mean, if we think about 30 percent of a population were once farmers and now that's only 3 percent. To me, that's, you know, when, when I hear these numbers, I we just we need to be really, really concerned. Um, two things. First, it shows that our food is basically provided from somewhere else. Someone else is bringing these food from another part of the world. We are not the creator of our own food. Um, two, how terrible is that, that we cannot uh, support, you know, having local farmers and local food providers? How terrible is this and how did that become so normal? for us not to, you know, support our food providers. I mean, if thinking about it, this should be our, um, it should be a very big aim of, of every government and every society to support um, its own uh, food production. Uh, and that's something that is basically, I, I, it amazes me of how um, these policies have been uh, going through over and over and over again. And for decades now, it is so normal to say, you know, looking at a, like you said, tomato and say, oh, uh, it, it came from Mexico and that is normal. Whereas, you know, if we talk to our grandparents, tomatoes coming from another country, no, that or or if you go back to history, no, that was not normal. That was not OK. Um, I think that's something that we all need to take a moment and think about uh, what went wrong and how how we can basically uh, fix that. <laughs> my my mother's grandmother, my mom used to always tell stories about her grandmother would be, it would be two o'clock in the afternoon and she's done with other things she's going to do. So she's going to go make chicken dinner. And so she would walk out and kill a chicken and, and it would be on the table in, in, you know, an hour, two hours or an hour long. And the notion of going to a grocery store and buying a chicken would have been completely foreign to her. It was completely foreign to her. Um, and then also I just want to say, that when you go from 30% of people being farmers to or 3%, another implication of that is that the ones who've been driven out, and this is how capitalism works, are the ones who have 10 acres, the ones who have 20 acres. And for the most part, of course, there's going to be a few of them, but for the most part, the ones that remain are not going to be, you know, some guy wearing overalls or some woman wearing overalls, but instead it's going to be Tyson Foods. It's going to be these huge mega corporations. And that was something that a lot of chicken farmers that I knew personally were complaining about in the 90s were that they had been independent small chicken farmers and they were all basically being uh, indentured is a strong word, but they were essentially being indentured to the big mega corporations. They were no longer independent farmers, but instead they were subcontractors to the one big conglomerate. Absolutely, yes, and we see that not with uh, not only with um, agriculture, um, 
but in you know and and uh, factory farming but uh, another part of well, the film where i visit the rlc um, I mean, that's exactly how the story of RLC started, you know, uh, the area. Um, RLC is located in, in today's Uzbekistan. Um, and basically, it was one of the world's uh, largest lakes in the world, I think fourth or fifth largest lake in the world. And, you know, during the Soviet um, Union years, um, you know, basically the Russians went went to the RLC and uh, used the water, fresh water for irrigation and cultivation of uh, cotton and uh, wheat mainly um, for basically decades. So RLC is right now one tenth of its original size. Um, so people living around RLC were basically mainly fishers, fishermen, and you know it was like an important port basically. The town of Moynak, very you know um, very basically prosperous um, city. Um, business was doing really good. Um, we see through um, footages that basically was one of the important ports for um, importing and exporting goods and uh, and also um, fishery and so uh, fishing markets and everything. So when I visited the RLC with my brother, um, that was one of the uh, understanding moments where we're like we need to really turn this into a documentary uh, but basically what you see now is that it's a desert and you know we stayed there for one night uh, and it was one of the rules of in Uzbekistan you can't basically stay in a in a city or town unless it's a hotel or a hostel and the town of Moynak had none I mean the only hotel in town was was shut down um, it was a very, very poor, um, I won't even call it city anymore. I would say a village that, you know, you don't see many doors. You don't see many people. Everybody, it's like a deserted area. A uh, few families left that lived there. And then one uh, kind gentleman basically allowed us to stay there for the evening. And he told us the story of his father that was a, um, a fisherman. And that's how he lived his life. And is by generation, this is, you know, this is how they lived and survived. And uh, his father died of um, cancer and high pollution of uh, water pollution, contaminated water of RLC. Um, at the moment, the sea, I mean, the fish and seafood is not even um, edible there. Uh, and, and he basically told me that the majority of people died of cancer um, or toxic related diseases. And the rest were like, you know, money is not in this town anymore. And they left. Uh, for 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 promises of jobs elsewhere, um, so that is another example of uh, pretty much you know um, thinking of only profit and uh, destroying life in in an area and then moving on to the next. And uh, you know if you think about it in a small scale, uh, okay, maybe only one lake, but no, this is not only one lake. We are seeing the uh, results of desertification and. Um, you know, um, climate change throughout the world. Uh, and most importantly, it's not only affecting our lifestyle, but also um, other species and the rest of the planet, something that uh, a lot of us forget to think about, right? So you, we, we have like 10 minutes left. And um, I was like, a couple a couple of questions I want to ask you. One of them is people have asked me many times what lessons I want people to learn from the whole lockdown of the last couple of years. And one of the things I always say is, is I want for people to understand the utter stupidity of having a non-local food system, that it can be interdicted by, by a political lockdown, it can be interdicted by a war, it can be interdicted by a disease, it can be interdicted by anything that shuts down the global economy. And it seems to me that that's just a remarkably stupid way to uh, to uh, distribute something that if you don't get it, you die. Correct. Um, so, yeah, that is that is very important for <laughs> everyone to really uh, reflect and think about. And, uh, you know, we have to be uh, sufficient in, and, and supportive of local food system and food production. I mean, um, if there is one lesson that uh, or something that I learned throughout the journey of sustenance is that we need to consume locally, but we need to think universally. 
um, I mean, whether we like it or not, we're living in a globalized world and everything is pretty much connected. <laughs> and, um, you know, at least as a citizen or as someone that is thinking um, about not only the well-being of him or herself, but but also the rest of people and the rest of our planet, uh, the least we can do. The least we can do for ourselves and for others is to consume locally and think universally. Really think, you know, um, if I'm thinking of my own gain um, and thinking that, you know, I'm just going to save money uh, or uh, it doesn't matter really. If, if, if we just put our think, thinking that way and be narcissistic about our consumption, the result is going to be what we are experiencing now. I mean, it's complete devastation of of not, not only, um, you know, one side of the world, but now it's becoming the problem of the entire earth. Uh, maybe it's not very fragile for some of us living in privileged part of the world, but, uh, you know, it is going to happen to the side of the world as well. I mean, pretty much like a warning. Um, if, if we don't really think about it and do anything about it, whether we like it or not, one day this trouble is going to knock at our door as well. So you mentioned earlier the the concept of farm to table and on one level that seems pretty uh a straightforward concept but for those who don't know what you mean a what is it and b if you are living in i don't know toronto or living in detroit or living in a small town it doesn't matter how would one get started even eating farm to table if you if you start at zero and you have absolutely no idea what to do. So first off, what is it? Second off, how would somebody get started doing it? Doing it as a consumer? Sure. So farm to table is pretty much, you know, um eating off everything that your local farmers and ranchers provide seasonally and locally. Um, <clears throat> and the concept of this is basically supporting those food providers and in return uh, receiving fresh um, and nutrition, nutritional food um, that is basically sold daily or weekly. Um, and instead of uh, purchasing your food from the third party, which is like a huge grocery store. It's going directly to those food providers. And that is why we have farmers market or, you know, different um, places where you can gather and directly deal with those farmers. Pretty much like an old concept. But, um, you know, now it's becoming more accessible um, to people. I mean, you know, thinking about it, living in a city based societies, um, it is the, the easiest convenient way is to go to your uh, grocery store and, you know, or to your Walmart and basically get uh, grain based and agriculture based uh, food provided from another part of the world. But, you know, there's also an alternative, which is going directly to these farmers and ranchers. Um, so, yeah, one would be to go into these places and farmers market. The other way is you know, um, thanks to technology, there are many places that you can just place your order online and these farmers uh, will bring it to your door or make good uh, relationship with these farms and farmers and, you know, get out of cities once a week, get your, you know, food for weekly or biweekly. Um, and instead of supporting this, uh, you know, chain grocery store, which is pretty much paying nobody and just putting all the profits in old pocket like like Walmart, um, you know, spend your money uh, in in these places and support local food production system. Um, not only it's good for the society and and your um, you know basically your the, the society and also people living around you and the communities. It's also beneficial for your own health. Um, so it's pretty much you know giving advantage and to everyone. And um, the other the other way is basically to uh, you know. Do your own, um, make your own food. Uh, some people would like to hunt and fish. Some people love their gardens and they create their own food. So basically getting, uh, being more close and closer to, uh, your food supplier and, and, <laughs> and food rather than having it travel for thousands of kilometers or from, from other countries. Okay. So really my last, my last, oh no, two questions. Sorry. One of them is if they made you, a uh, czar of the world food system, what would you do? And I know we're running out of time, so so make that pretty quick. And then the second question is going to be, how can people find out more about uh, you and your work and this film in particular, but also your work in general? So first off, uh, today I, I anoint you czar of the world food system. What do you do? Um, and second is, how do people find out more about your work? 
Sure. So um, if I was in charge, um, A, I would, um, you know, help and support um, food providers, uh, farmers and ranchers, uh, local farms, organic farms, uh, uh, and um, basically farms that are supporting the pastoral uh, food production and the grass-fed uh, food production system. Um, also, I would eliminate um, important exports of food from other countries, um, and I would make food seasonal um, and local and accessible to everyone. Also, having access to good food and water shouldn't be very expensive and it shouldn't be this difficult. Um, I would also educate children and uh, people in educational sectors uh, to discuss the importance of uh, creating food um, holistically and locally. Um, these are the type of things that I would do. And also finding about the sustenance. So yes, everyone can watch sustenance online. Um, you can visit our website at www.sustenancemovie.com. Uh, if you're in North America, there are many, many different ways to watch it. Uh, you can just go on the website and find out or search it or Google it. Um, and international um, viewers can also watch it uh, from around the world. And then your work in general, can you give your website? Yes, uh, my website is Um So it's a website that uh, it's with me and my brother, Davud, and our works can be found there. Okay, well, also, I just need to put in a quick plug that, that yeah, I was in sustenance, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is I've seen it. It's a fantastic film, and I think everybody should watch it. Um, Thank you. And, and uh, I would like to thank you for your work, Yati, and um, I would like to thank you for being on the program. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Yati Garami. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.